Public Relations. Edward L. Bernays. 1945. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Part 2. Public Relations in Action. 14. The Engineering of Consent. Democracy has been defined as government by the consent of the governed. But today our society is so complex that it is not government alone that needs the public's consent. Every group and, for that matter, every individual needs the understanding and support of public opinion, in order to become integrated into our democratic society. To achieve this integration, the individuals or groups who wish to present their case to the public must employ one or more of the media of communication. These media the press, motion pictures, radio, television, and so on are now immense in their impact, reaching millions of people, sometimes the entire nation. It took time for people to recognize that there are basic principles and techniques by which they can improve their public relations. And it took time for them to recognize that modern means of communication are more than a highly organized mechanical web. They are also a potent force for social good or evil. Thus an important factor in present-day public relations is the standard or social responsibility which its best practitioners maintain. The relationship between modern communications and social responsibility was the theme of a special issue of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. That issue, devoted to communication and social action, contained my article on the engineering of consent, a phrase that subsequently became a synonym for certain aspects of public relations. The following chapter, based on that article, discusses basic principles and techniques of the engineering of consent. Freedom of speech and its democratic corollary, a free press, have tacitly expanded our Bill of Rights to include the right of persuasion. This development was an inevitable result of the expansion of the media of expression. All these media provide open doors to the public mind, and through them any one of us may influence the attitudes and actions of our fellow citizens. Knowledge of how to use this enormous amplifying system becomes a matter of primary concern to all persons who are interested in socially constructive action. There are two principal divisions of this communication system which maintain social cohesion. On the first level are the commercial media. Approximately 1,800 daily newspapers in the United States have a combined circulation of nearly 53 million. There are approximately 8,500 weekly newspapers and more than 7,600 magazines. Approximately 3,000 radio stations of various types broadcast to the nation's 96 million receiving sets. There are 102 television stations in the United States, 12,769,300 television sets, and a potential television audience of 40 million people. Approximately 15,000 motion picture houses have a capacity of almost 12 million. A deluge of books and pamphlets is published annually. The country is blanketed with billboards, handbills, throwaways, and direct mail advertising. Round tables, panels and forums, classrooms and legislative assemblies, and public platforms any and all media, day after day, spread the word, someone's word. On the second level there are the specialized media owned and operated by the many organized groups in the country. Almost all such groups, and many of their subdivisions, have their own communication systems. They disseminate ideas not only by means of the written word in labor papers, house organs, special bulletins, and the like, but also through lecturers, meetings, discussions, and rank-and-file conversations. The web of communications, sometimes duplicating, crisscrossing, and overlapping, is a condition of fact, not theory. We must recognize the significance of modern communications not only as a highly organized mechanical web but as a potent force for social good or possible evil. We can determine whether this network shall be employed to its greatest extent for sound social ends, for only by mastering the techniques of communication can leadership be exercised fruitfully in the vast complex that is democracy in the United States. In an earlier age, in a society that was small geographically and was more homogeneous, a leader was usually known to his followers personally, there was a visual relationship between them. Communication was accomplished principally by personal announcement to an audience or through a relatively primitive printing press. Books, Pamphlets, and newspapers reached a very small literate segment of the public. We constantly hear that the world has grown smaller, but this so-called truism is not actually true by any means. The world has grown both smaller and very much larger. Its physical frontiers have been expanded. Today's leaders have become more remote physically from the public, yet, at the same time, the public has become much more familiar with them through the system of modern communications. Leaders are just as potent today as ever. In turn, this system, which has constantly expanded as a result of technological improvement, has helped leaders overcome the problems of geographical distance and social stratification in reaching their publics. 
Underlying much of this expansion, and largely the reason for its existence in its present form, is the widespread and enormously rapid increase in literacy among the people of the world, especially the United States. Leaders are the spokesmen from many different points of view. They may direct the activities of major organized groups such as industry, labor, or units of government. They may compete with one another in battles for public goodwill, or they may, representing divisions within the larger units, compete among themselves. These leaders, with the aid of technicians who have specialized in utilizing the channels of communication, have been able to accomplish purposefully and scientifically the engineering of consent. This phrase means, quite simply, the use of an engineering approach that is, action based only on thorough knowledge of the situation and on the application of scientific principles and tried practices in the task of getting people to support ideas and programs. Any person or organization depends ultimately on public approval and is therefore faced with the problem of engineering the public's consent to a program or goal. We expect our elected government officials to try to engineer our consent through the network of communications open to them for the measures they propose. We reject government authoritarianism or regimentation, but we are willing to be persuaded by the written or spoken word. The engineering of consent is the very essence of the democratic process, the freedom to persuade and suggest. The freedoms of speech, press, petition, and assembly, the freedoms that make the engineering of consent possible, are among the most cherished guarantees of the Constitution of the United States. Theoretically and practically the consent should be based on the complete understanding of those whom the engineering attempts to win over but it is sometimes impossible to reach joint decisions based on an understanding of facts by all the people. With pressing crises and decisions to be faced, often a leader cannot wait for the people to arrive at even general understanding. In certain cases, democratic leaders must play their part in leading the public through the engineering of consent to socially constructive goals and values. This role naturally imposes upon them the obligation to use educational processes, as well as other available techniques, to bring about as complete an understanding as possible. Under no circumstances should the engineering of consent supersede or displace the functions of the educational system, either formal or informal, in promoting understanding in the people as a basis for their action. But the engineering of consent often does supplement the educational process. If higher general educational standards were to prevail in this country and the general level of public knowledge and understanding were raised as a result, this approach would still retain its value. Even in a society of a perfectionist educational standard, equal progress would not be achieved in every field. There would always be time lags, blind spots, and points of weakness, and the engineering of consent would still be essential. The engineering of consent will always be needed as an adjunct to, or a partner of, the educational process. Today it is impossible to overestimate the importance of engineering consent, it affects almost every aspect of our daily lives. When used for social purposes, it is among our most valuable contributions to the efficient functioning of modern society. But the techniques can be subverted, demagogues can utilize them for anti-democratic purposes as successfully as those who employ them for socially desirable ends. The responsible leader, to accomplish social objectives, must therefore be constantly aware of the possibilities of subversion. He must apply his energies to mastering the operational know-how of consent engineering and to outmaneuvering his opponents in the public interest. In part 1 of this book I have shown how the profession of public relations has arisen to assist today's leaders in consent engineering. Just as the civil engineer must analyze every element of the situation before he builds a bridge, so in order to achieve a worthwhile social objective, the engineer of consent must operate from a foundation of soundly planned action. In an earlier chapter this aspect of public relations was considered briefly, but it requires further expansion here. If we assume that he is engaged in a specific task, he must draw up his plans. These plans must be based on four prerequisites. 1. Calculation of resources, both human and physical manpower, money, and time available for the purpose. 2. Thorough knowledge of the subject. 3. Determination of objectives, subject to possible change after research specifically, what is to be accomplished, with whom and through whom. And, 4. Research of the public to learn why and how it acts, both individually and as a group. Only after this preliminary groundwork has been firmly laid is it possible to know whether the objectives are realistically attainable. Only then can the engineer of consent utilize his resources of manpower, money, and time, and the media available. Strategy, organization, and activities will be geared to the realities of the situation. The task must first be related to the budget available for manpower and mechanics. In terms of human assets, the consent engineer has certain talents creative, administrative, and executive and he must know what these are. He should also have a clear knowledge of his limitations. 
The human assets need to be implemented by workspace and office equipment. All material needs must be provided for. Above all else, once the budget has been established and before another step is taken, the field of knowledge related to the subject should be thoroughly explored. This is primarily a matter of collecting and codifying a store of information that will be available for practical, efficient use. The preliminary work may be tedious and exacting, but it cannot be bypassed, for the engineer of consent should be powerfully equipped with facts, with truths, with evidence, before he begins to show himself before a public. The consent engineer should provide himself with such standard reference books as N.W.A. Year and Sons Directory of Newspapers and Periodicals, the Editor and Publisher International Year Book, the Radio Annual, the Congressional Directory, the World Almanac and, of course, the Telephone Book. The World Almanac, for example, contains lists of many of the thousands of associations in the United States, a cross-section of the country, these and other volumes provide the basic library necessary to effective planning. At this point in the preparatory work, the engineer of consent should consider the objectives of his activity. He should have clearly in mind at all times precisely where he is going and what he wishes to accomplish. He may intensify already existing favorable attitudes, he may induce those holding favorable attitudes to take constructive action, he may convert disbelievers, he may disrupt certain antagonistic points of view. Goals should be defined exactly. In a Red Cross drive, for example, a time limit and the amount of money to be raised are set from the start. Much better results are obtained in a relief drive when the appeal is made for aid to the people of a specific country or locality rather than of a general area such as Europe or Asia. The objective must at all times be related to the public whose consent is to be obtained. That public is people, but what do they know? What are their present attitudes toward the situation with which the consent engineer is concerned? What are the impulses which govern these attitudes? What ideas are the people ready to absorb? What are they ready to do, given an effective stimulant? Do they get their ideas from bartenders, letter carriers, waitresses, Little Orphan Annie, or the editorial page of the New York Times? What group leaders or opinion molders effectively influence the thought process of what followers? What is the flow of ideas from whom to whom? To what extent do authority, factual evidence, persuasion, reason, tradition, and emotion play a part in the acceptance of these ideas? The public's attitudes, assumptions, ideas, or prejudices result from definite influences. One must try to find out what they are in any situation in which one is working. Who is the public? The phrase public opinion seemingly implies the existence of a united, cohesive public. Such a public can exist, perhaps, in times of a vital need or emergency, but ordinarily what we call the public is made up of many publics or groups banded together because of some common interest. A political tactician, in planning his campaign, first roughly classifies his public into those who are for him and do not need to be propagandized, those who are dead against him, and those who do not belong to either of those two groups but may be swayed. Such an analysis of the public is simple and elementary, but only rarely can the public be so definitely classified. The public may, for some purposes, be classified according to geographical distribution. Or it may be divided according to age groups. For example, sponsors of Hopalong Cassidy a predominantly juvenile public, whereas the Townsend plan appealed to an elderly following. The public may also be divided according to sex, financial status, occupation, economic or political belief, or social grouping in the narrower sense. It may be classified according to reading habits, intellectual capacities, position as leaders or followers, employers or employed, religious affiliations, national derivations, or individual special interests in sports, philanthropies, hobbies, and so on. Again we have such voluntary groupings as professional organizations of doctors, lawyers, nurses, and the like, trade associations, farm associations and labor unions, women's clubs, religious groups, and the thousands of clubs and fraternal associations. Formal groups, such as political units, may range from organized minorities to the large, amorphous political bodies that are our two major parties. Today, there is still another category of the public group that must be kept in mind by the engineer of consent. The readers of the New Republic or the listeners to a popular radio or television commentator are as much voluntary groups, although unorganized, as are the members of a trade union or the Rotary Club. How can the persuader reach these groups that make up the large public? He can do so through their leaders, for the individual looks for guidance to the leaders of the groups to which he belongs. He may be dominated by the leaders of many groups, for the group cleavages of society are many and diversified. They play a vital part in the molding of public opinion, and they offer the propagandist a means of reaching vast numbers of individuals, 
for with so many confusing and conflicting ideas competing for the individual's attention, he is forced to look to others for authority. No man, in today's complicated world, can base his judgments and acts entirely on his own examination and weighing of the evidence. A credence in leaders is a sound shortcut when the leaders are sound. The group leader thus becomes a key figure in the molding of public opinion, and his acceptance of a given idea carries with it the acceptance of many of his followers through many channels. The function of key leaders as mediums for reaching large groups of the population is of primary importance and must never be overlooked. Moreover, they not only convey ideas to the public, but also interpret and make articulate to the propagandist, for his guidance, the groups they represent. Take it all together, they represent the whole public. It is through group cohesion and group leadership that one can awaken public interest most speedily and constructively. The repeal of prohibition was achieved not by directly converting millions of people, but by enlisting the active support of leaders of groups to which millions of people belonged. To achieve accurate working knowledge of the receptivity of the public mind to an idea, it is necessary to engage in painstaking research, which should undertake to establish a common denominator between the researcher and the public. It should disclose the realities of the objective situation in which the engineer of consent has to work. Completed, it provides a blueprint of action and clarifies the question of who does what, where, when, and why. It will indicate the overall strategy to be employed, the themes to be stressed, the organization needed, the use of media, and the day-to-day -day tactics. It should further indicate how long it will take to win the public and what are the short and long-term trends of public thinking. It will disclose subconscious and conscious motivations in public thought, and the actions, words, and pictures that affect these motivations. It will reveal public awareness, the low or high visibility of ideas in the public mind. Research may indicate the necessity to modify original objectives, to enlarge or contract the planned goal, or to change actions and methods. In short, it furnishes the equivalent of the mariner's chart, the architect's blueprint, the traveler's roadmap. Public opinion research may be conducted by questionnaires, by personal interviews, or by polls. Contact can be made with business leaders, heads of trade associations, trade union officials, and educational leaders, all of whom may be willing to aid the engineer of consent. The heads of professional groups in the communities the medical association, the architects, and the engineers all should be queried. So should social service executives, officials of women's clubs, and religious leaders. Editors, publishers, and radio station and motion picture personnel can be persuaded to discuss with the consent engineer his objectives and the appeals and angles that affect these leaders and their audiences. The local unions or associations of barbers, railwaymen, clothing workers, and taxicab drivers may be willing to cooperate in the undertaking. Grassroots leaders are important. Such a survey has a double-barreled effect. The engineer of consent learns what group leaders know and do not know, the extent to which they will cooperate with him, the media that reach them, appeals that may be valid, and the prejudices, the legends, or the facts by which they live. He is able simultaneously to determine whether or not they will conduct informational campaigns in their own right and thus supplement his activities. With the preliminary work done, one can proceed to actual planning. From the survey of opinion will emerge the major themes and strategy. These themes contain the ideas to be conveyed, they channel the lines of approach to the public, and they must be expressed through whatever media are used. The themes are ever-present but intangible comparable to what in fiction is called the storyline. To be successful, the themes must appeal to the motives of the public. Motives are the active conscious and subconscious pressures created by the force of desires. Psychologists have isolated a number of compelling appeals, the validity of which has been repeatedly proved in practical application. Self-preservation, ambition, pride, hunger, love of family and children, patriotism, imitativeness, the desire to be a leader, Love of play these and other drives are the psychological raw materials of which every leader must be aware in his endeavor to win the public to his point of view. The propagandist must analyze his problem in its relationship to the basic motives of the people and the groups to which they belong. He must therefore put his case in terms that will so appeal to fundamental motives as to get the attention and support of the leaders of the vast system of interlocking groups making up his public, as well as of their publics. The milk industry, for instance, Recognizing that milk has qualities that appeal to the self-preservation motive of human beings, finds that health, nutrition, and other authorities will of their own accord emphasize these qualities of milk to their publics. A public relations campaign must also reckon with the power of symbols. A symbol may be defined as a shortcut to understanding and to action. It is the currency of propaganda. It is a word or a picture. 
The connection established by the wets between the words racketeer and prohibition undoubtedly influenced public opinion against prohibition. The acceptance of a symbol is emotional and expresses an associative mental process stemming from familiarity. That symbols must be carefully chosen is self-evident. In publicizing a vast corporation, the symbol may be a single person at the head of the organization, it may be a slogan describing the product, or it may be a single department that performs a specific public service. It is the function of the public relations program to associate its special pleading with ideas to which the public is receptive. The potency of the same symbols is constantly changing. They must always be utilized intelligently. Once the themes are established, in what kind of campaign are they to be used? The situation may call for a blitzkrieg or a continuing battle, a combination of both, or some other strategy. It may be necessary to develop a plan of action for an election that will be over in a few weeks or months, or for a campaign that may take years, such as the effort to cut down the tuberculosis death rate. Planning for mass persuasion is governed by many factors that call upon all one's powers of training, experience, skill, and judgment. Planning should be flexible and provide for changed conditions. When the plans have been perfected, organization of resources must be undertaken in advance to provide the necessary manpower, money, and physical equipment. Organization also correlates the activities of any specialists who may be called upon from time to time, such as opinion researchers, fundraisers, publicity agents, radio and motion picture experts, specialists for women's clubs and foreign language groups, and the like. At this point it will be possible to plan the tactics of the program, that is, to decide how the themes are to be disseminated over the idea carriers, the networks of communication. Do not think of tactics in terms of segmental approaches. The problem is not to get articles into a newspaper or obtain radio time or arrange for a motion picture newsreel, it is, rather, to set in motion a broad activity, the success of which depends on interlocking all phases and elements of the proposed strategy, implemented by tactics that are timed to the moment of maximum effectiveness. An action held over but one day may fall completely flat. Skilled and imaginative timing has determined the success of many mass movements and campaigns, the familiar phenomena so typical of the American people's behavior pattern. Emphasis of the consent engineer's activities will be on the written and spoken word, geared to the media, he uses and designed for the audiences he is addressing. He must be sure that his material fits his public. He must prepare copy written in simple language and 16-word sentences for the average public, which has completed 8.8 years of schooling, though some copy will be aimed at the level of people who have had 17 years of schooling. He must familiarize himself with all media and know how to supply them with material suitable in quantity and quality. Primarily, however, the engineer of consent must create news. News is not an inanimate thing. It is the overt act that makes news, and news in turn shapes the attitudes and actions of people. A good criterion of whether something is or is not news is whether the event juts out of the pattern of routine. The developing of events and circumstances that are not routine is one of the basic functions of the engineer of consent. Events so planned can be projected over the communication systems to infinitely more people than those actually participating, and such events vividly dramatize ideas for those who do not witness the events. The imaginatively managed event can successfully compete for attention with other events. Newsworthy events, involving people, usually do not happen by accident. They are planned deliberately to accomplish a purpose, to influence ideas and actions. Events may also be set up in chain reaction. By harnessing the energies of group leaders, the engineer of consent can stimulate them to set in motion activities of their own. They will organize additional, specialized, subsidiary events, all of which will further dramatize the basic theme. Communication is the key to engineering consent for social action. But it is not enough to get out leaflets and bulletins on the mimeograph machines, to place releases in the newspapers, or to fill the airwaves with radio talks. Words, sounds, and pictures accomplish little unless they are the tools of a soundly thought-out plan and carefully organized methods. If the plans are well formulated and the proper use is made of them, the ideas conveyed by the words will become part and parcel of the people themselves. When the public is convinced of the soundness of an idea, it will proceed to action. People translate an idea into action suggested by the idea itself, whether it is ideological, political, or social. They may adopt a philosophy that stresses racial and religious tolerance, they may vote a new deal into office, or they may organize a consumer's buying strike. But such results do not just happen. In a democracy they can be accomplished most effectively by the engineering of consent.